This is the uh, last case of our call. It is People versus Dixon. It is also a mini oral argument on the application, which means you each have 15 minutes. And Mr. Curcio, you can attempt to reserve some of that for rebuttal. And if you are ready to go, you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. Nick Curcio on behalf of Defendant Eamon Dixon. Uh, if possible, I'd like to try to reserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal. Your Honors, and may it please the court. In People versus Dorrington, this court recognized the key distinction between objects that are inherently harmful and objects that ordinarily bear a harmless character. So, cell phones clearly fall in the latter category. They are ubiquitous throughout our society and are generally allowed in some of our most secure institutions, including banks, schools, courthouses, and other government buildings. In light of their broad acceptance and legitimate uses, the Court of Appeals erred in holding that the mere possession of cell phones necessarily, and in all cases, threaten the security of a penal institution for purposes of OV-19. When properly understood, OV-19 requires an individualized inquiry into the offender's conduct and the actual risk it posed to the security of the prison or jail where the defendant is housed. In cases like this one, where there is no evidence that the defendant intended to use the cell phone for nefarious purposes, Dorrington prohibits inferring nefarious intent from the mere act of possession. Because the Court of Appeals per se rule is based on that improper inference, this court should grant Mr. Dixon's application, reverse the Court of Appeals decision, and remand this case for resentencing without OV-19 enhancement. Uh, with that, I'll, I'm happy to entertain any questions the court may have. Thank you. I will begin with Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, no questions for me. Justice Welch. No questions. Justice Zara. So what about something that's um similar to a cell phone, I guess, alcohol. If if a if a prisoner is found with alcohol, is that something where we'd need an individualized determination that the possession of the alcohol could pose a threat or is eminent threat uh, to award 25 points? Or are there some things that are innocuous that the mere possession would in fact support the uh, 25 points under OV-19? So I, I think there are, are certainly some objects that are, are so inherently dangerous that the mere possession does warrant OV-19. And the Court of Appeals has addressed some of those, those things already. Um, in the Dickinson case, the Court of Appeals addressed heroin. And in that case, found that just that it, although the case technically involves smuggling, Court of Appeals reasoning suggests that just the, the mere possession of heroin is, is so inherently dangerous that it would warrant um, the scoring of OV-19. The court said the same thing about weapons, dangerous weapons, although that wasn't before it. I do think alcohol is a harder case and a case where a, a court might need to make an individualized determination, perhaps based on the quantity of alcohol. Um, the, the offender's history with use of alcohol, um, any of those um, things could potentially be relevant in that analysis. Um, perhaps the same thing with, with marijuana, um, but, but certainly um, heroin is, is one that the Court of Appeals has specifically addressed and, and other items that could just by their very use potentially kill the person who uses them. Um, or cause serious serious physical ailments. Those would be the types of, of drugs that a per se rule might be appropriate. Um, we, we just don't believe that a per se rule is appropriate here, where the where the object has so many legitimate uses as cell phones do. Thank you, Justice Viviano. Do cell phones have le any legitimate uses by a prisoner within a prison? They, they don't have any lawful uses within the prison, Your Honor. We, we're certainly not contesting that, um, th that they are, are legal to possess or that um, the, the legislature wasn't within its rights to prohibit them and to make their possession a five-year felony. The, our, our point is that we believe that cell phones are sometimes used for what we would call innocuous purposes with, within prisons um, to communicate with family to communicate with friends for for things um, other than, than criminal activity, aside from the obvious prohibition of possessing them in the first place. And you know, the uh, the record indicates that such use does occur on, on occasion during the uh, recent, sorry, not the resentencing, the hearing on the motion to correct the invalid sentence, the, the defense counsel referred to a case that was before that court previously involving an, an individual who was possessing a cell phone and using a cell phone solely to, to contact um, his family and uh, actually his, his son's school. 
So that's, that's just an anecdote, but we, we do believe there are cases where, where cell phones are used within the prison context in ways that would ordinarily be categorized as innocuous. Related to possession of a cell phone, what would have to be shown to justify the scoring um, of this offense variable? We um, gave some examples in our brief, Your Honor, uh, we believe that evidence such as um, calls to known associates, certainly evidence of uh, text messages or, or emails or other types of things um, involving the, the, you know, relating to criminal activity would, would warrant the scoring. We do believe that um, one of the things that this guideline gets at is committing crimes outside of the prison, committing crimes in the outside world. So to the extent there's any evidence that it's used for that purpose, or to coordinate smuggling of items within the, the prison, we believe all of those would warrant um, the scoring of OB-19. There just isn't any evidence of, of that in this case. And in fact, no evidence that the phone was ever used in this case. So just so we're clear, there would have to be actual use of the cell phone? We, we believe that's one of the ways that OV-19 could be scored, actual use of the cell phone to perpetuate criminal activity. Uh, other ways it might be scored and might involve acquisition of the phone, such as acquisition of the phone by violence, act actively participating in the smuggling of the phone, we believe could potentially qualify. Again, there's no evidence in this case um, that, that Mr. Dixon was involved in smuggling the phone into the, uh, into the prison. We, we don't know how he acquired the phone. Um, and without that evidence, we can't, that we don't believe the scoring is warranted on that basis. Well, he would have obtain the phone through some illicit means, right? He could, could have obtained, the, there's actually an affidavit saying he obtained the phone from, um, from a cellmate. So well, our, our point is that it's not clear that he was, he was physically involved, or he was involved in the, the scheming to bring the phone into the prison in the first place. Could have acquired the phone once it was already in the prison. Okay, thank you, counsel. Thanks. Justice Bernstein. Hey, counsel. Good morning. Just to follow up a little bit on Justice Viviano's line of questioning. In this case, with these specific facts, should there be any enhancement? No, Your Honor. And I don't believe the prosecution has, has argued otherwise. I mean, the, the other enhancements within OV-19 up on their face wouldn't apply it's either the 25 point enhancement or a, a zero point enhancement un, under the specific offense variable. I see. So if this court was to rule in, if this court was to rule in your favor, what would the impact be on the correctional organizations? I mean, ultimately, you know, it, it, you know it, the, that, that enhancement was put there for a specific reason has been kind of outlined in this case. And if this court was to side with your position, what implication would that entail? Do you feel for the governance of the prison, uh, with the governance of the prison system? So it would result in a lower sentence in this case, and and in any case um, in, involving OV nineteen, if OV nineteen is scored at zero instead of twenty five, but that right. certainly doesn't bring the sentence to zero in this particular case. It brings the guideline range down from five to 17 to zero to 17. So it's a fairly, um, fa fairly minor change in the sentencing guideline here. It could be more significant um, in other cases where there are other offenses and guidelines involved. For example, in the Carpenter case, I think the difference, it made more a difference of closer to a year as opposed to the five months in, in this case. But we're essentially talking about a, a moving of the guidelines range. We're not arguing that this, uh, that this, uh, um, crime is not illegal. Um, it, it certainly is. It's a five-year felony and uh, in, in any case could warrant a sentence of five years, but it would require an upward departure to do that. So we don't think it undermines what the legislature was trying to accomplish here um, to score this at zero in these cases without evidence of nefarious intent. And it, it certainly doesn't, um, it wouldn't permit uh, cell phones to be possessed within prisons, it would just affect the, the scoring. I understand. I just have one last question. Do, do you see what I'm trying to weigh here? What I'm trying to balance is, is that the whole notion of kind of, you know, prison governance is, is that if there's a rule, there's a rule. 
And if, if you start, and, and I understand that the complication that kind of arises in it, but if you start to weaken that rule, then it, it could potentially have an effect on the overall governance structure of the institution. That's my concern. I, I understand the, the concern, Your Honor. We would submit that the, the legislature did not intend for OV-19 to apply to all crimes committed within a penal institution. We think that's clear from the wording of the 25-point enhancement refers to um, a defendants that by their conduct threaten the security of a penal institution. We think the word threat carries, um, carries it was intended to denote significant offenses, offenses that, that cause significant risk to, a, to the penal institution not just kind of run of the mill um, crimes that were uh, that happen within jails. If the legislature had intended to apply OV-19 to all crimes committed within a, a penal context, we believe they would have used different wording and specifically said um, crimes committed within a prison or something to that effect. And as we pointed out in our brief, guidelines in, in some other states do use that wording. So we think that by using the word threaten the security of the penal institution, the legislature um, kind of pointed out that, that these are tried to make the point that this is a a fairly serious offense and that only it should only be scored when the offense itself is very serious. We do think that the possession and use of a cell phone can be serious in some cases and our submission is that it just requires some additional evidence submitted by the prosecutor to show in, in each individualized case that that, that, that is the case. Counsel, um, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I know. Counsel, thank you. I, I understand your position. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Clement. Uh, no questions, thank you. Uh, you have three minutes, you may reserve it. I'd like to reserve that, Your Honor, thank you. You bet, uh, Mr. Stratton. Good morning, Your Honors. Robert Stratton, P66995, the Chippewa County Prosecutor appearing for the State of Michigan Plaintiff Appellee. First off, I'd like to state MCL 801.262A which deals with prisoners possessing a cell phone is a five-year felony and falls under the crimes against public safety classification. It's also the same identical classification and statutory max as prisoners possessing of a weapon, which is MCL 800.2834 and prisoner possessing contraband, MCL 800.2814. They're all public safety and class H five-year felonies. Cell phones are used for a lot of general purposes in the general public, such as you use your cell phones to collect your music, to communicate with your family members, to make phone calls. It also is used for your cameras, for video recording. And also it's, it's, a, it's basically a mini computer that everyone has on them at all times. If, you're, if the legislature made it perfectly clear when they created the statute that just by the essence of a prisoner possessing a cell phone in a prison was so dangerous to the facility that they actually made it a five-year felony. Uh, Michigan Department of Corrections, and if you, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever received a phone call from anyone a, either in a jail or a prison from Michigan Department of Corrections or from a federal prison, the first thing they'll tell you is that it's coming from the facility, but it'll also tell you that the phone call is being monitored and recorded for the safety and security of the facility. That is another reason why I believe the statute was written the way it was, not because of what the intent of the individual is, is whether or not how he was using the cell phone, it was the fact that he actually had the cell phone in the facility. In this case, the defendant was at the Kinross Correctional Facility on uh, May 21st of 2006. It was a little bit after midnight, specifically at 12.09 a.m. He was located in the uh, D2 bathroom in Kinross Correctional Facility where they had discovered that he had a cell phone in his possession. Once they secured the phone, they ended up going to his cell and they found the charger for the cell phone. I believe that based on the statute as well as OB-19, which specifically says the offender by his or her conduct threatens the security of a penal institution. I believe that that is met by just based on the fact that he was possessing a cell phone, which creates a situation where the Michigan Department of Corrections can't monitor any phone calls coming from that phone. They can't monitor any videos or any pictures that may be sent to other individuals either within that same facility or another facility or to the general public, as well as anything else that's being brought in. My office prosecutes numerous cases over the years with people smuggling stuff into the facility. And sometimes we're actually able to figure out things are coming in just based on the recorded conversations with those phone calls. If 
if the cell phone was not a danger to the facility and it wasn't a five-year felony, people would continue to possess them. I don't believe that you have to show that there was an, uh, some unlawful intent to possess it. Mr. Stratton, uh, let, me, let me interrupt you and, and get to people's questions and then we can come back to you if, if you have more time. Sorry. Yeah, no problem, Justice Kavanaugh. No questions for me. Justice Welch. Uh, yes, uh, so Mr. Stratton, I'm, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, we obviously know that it is a felony to possess a cell phone. I don't think anyone's debating the, that the law is clear on that. Um, but obviously what we're here talking about today is offense variables uh, and sort of this enhancement. Um, and if you read OV-19, uh, it says the offender by his or her conduct threatened the security of a penal institution. So Correct. does it, you know, it, 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 your argument, I guess, is that cell phones always threaten the security and we shouldn't look at the circumstances. Is that accurate? No, I'm saying that every time somebody's in possession of a cell phone, it's endangering the facility because they're not able to monitor any communication coming from those cell phones. Just like the courts have previously held with possession of weapons or contraband in the prison, those instances endanger the facility too because people get, get assaulted for those items. They are able to use them on other individuals. And the cell phone, one instance I would use is with the cell phone is, is that if you get into a fight with another inmate, you, if you have a cell phone in the facility, you can certainly turn around and take a picture of the Otis page of the defendant and send it to another person in the other facility where this guy's getting sent to. And the Michigan Department of Corrections has no idea that that's being done because it's on a unmonitored cell phone. And by having that cell phone in, that, in your possession, not only are you using, you can use it for unlawful purposes, but anyone else that knows that you have that, have access to that. That's why corrections officers are not allowed to bring in their own cell phones into the facility. Because if they bring that into the facility or they have that in the facility, then you're, getting, you're, un, you're understanding the fact that somebody can take that cell phone from you. And now it's back into the general population and you have no control over it once it's in the, in the facility because it could end up anywhere. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sarah? Is there any set of circumstances that you can articulate for me where a prisoner commits a crime while in prison that would not warrant the 25 points for OV-19? No, because not the way the statute's written and not the way the charges are. And I believe that anytime someone possesses a weapon in the facility, it's a danger to the facility and the security of the facility. Anytime you have drugs being brought in or, or being stored in the facility, certainly indeed endangers the facility. And the court has ruled on both of those as saying, yes, absolutely. And I think the last prong is whether or not cell phones endanger the facility. And by this individual's conduct of possessing the cell phone and making whatever phone calls at 12.06 at night when he should have been sleeping, that's a concern and that's a danger to the, to the facility. So, so every, every crime within the walls of the prison will result in 25 points under OB-19? It depends, yeah, under cell phones, I believe it would be. Well, any crime. I mean, I, I, are you taking the position that the minute that there's a crime detected and the security within the prison has to di divert its attention to addressing that crime, that that necessarily weakens the security in other aspects of the prison? Not all crimes, because you have some assaults that occur in the prison that are not, that don't endanger the facility. Sometimes you have, it, it depends. If you're, if you're talking about possession of weapons, absolutely, it endangers the facility. If you're talking about drugs, absolutely endangers the facility. If you're talking about cell phones, absolutely. But if we're talking about simple assaults, no. Okay, thank you. Justice Viviano. Counsel, can you just help me understand this, uh, the sort of the procedural history of this case a little bit better? The defendant's charged as a habitual fourth offender, is that right? That is correct. And does that make this a life offense? It could have made it up to life in prison, that is correct. That's not what he pled to though. Now I understand the, the plea bargain, he was allowed, the, the habitual fourth was dismissed, is that right? Correct. And uh, the, the maximum, he's allowed to plead to a, 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 an added charge of attempt? That is correct. My reading of the attempt statute, though, doesn't doesn't make it uh, a two and a half year felony when the original felony is a five year felony. Instead, it remains as a five year felony. Is that your understanding, or am I misreading the attempt statute? I believe that would make it. That would still that would actually have still kept it a five year 
based on the attempt statute. So there's an, an five error years or more. That, there's an error here that may need to be corrected if the court that were is to correct. grant any relief for this defendant. He might face a longer uh, maximum punishment, right? That's correct. The uh, and was there a was there a sentence agreement or sentence bargain in this case? There was not. So when the guidelines go from five to 17 months, and then if we grant relief and all the time we're spending on this case, it would go to zero to 17 months. The circuit judge would be well within his or her rights to give the defendant precisely the same 11 month sentence, right? That is correct. And when we talk about, I mean, whether something threatens the security of a penal institution, Right. The definition of threat, I think, is to just be a source of danger to. And I mean, I think you've given us some ideas of how a cell phone could be a source of danger to the security of a prison. But there, you could come up with any number of possible hypotheticals, including the fact that a cell, just having the cell phone by itself, is something that would be desirable within the jail, would it not? It would. So it could lead to to uh, uh, disputes between the inmates over the over the contraband, would it not? Correct. Um, in addition to all the other things that someone could do unmonitored with the cell phone. Um, anyways, all right, that's all, that's all I have. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Justice Bernstein. Hey, Counsel, good morning. I, I think I understand your position. Um, I guess my, my question is, and, and this is the balance that I'm trying to go with, and it's kind of analogous to what Justice Welch was asking, is, is that the, 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 the issue I have is, and we're doing the scoring, is, is that when you're dealing with, you, your position is that you could have, this is where I think this just gets a little complicated. Your position was that you could have like a simple assault within the facility and that wouldn't constitute jeopardy or uh, that would for the security of how the facility is run, but a cell phone just automatically does that. And I, and I also understand what Justice Aviano is, is asking is just the notion of a cell phone is, is, is um, so desirable that just its mere presence can create unrest. And, and I, I hear the, I, I, under, I really understand the back and forth and I respect it and I see it. Um, my challenge here is, is, is that it really comes down to the notion that, you know, your position that an assault doesn't create a security issue for the institution, but just the presence of a cell phone where somebody might just be listening to music automatically does. I mean, I gave you a long narrative, but do you see the, do you see the distinction or do you see kind of the, the balancing well, the, act and trying to follow? Well, the reason why I would say that a simple assault wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't be considered a threat to the security is because if that was the case, every single person who ever punched or assaulted another inmate would be automatically threatening a security. My issue is, is that with cell phones, you can do so many things with the cell phone once you get it into, and I'm going to say the prison as a market, once you get that cell phone into the market, unless the, unless it's recovered, it can exchange hands numerous times and they don't even know it exists. You can use the cell phone to help people escape. You can have, you can send out phone calls to bring stuff in and the prison doesn't even know about this stuff because again, it's not being recorded. It's not being monitored. And that's the whole process as to why phone calls in the prison are always recorded and monitored is to be able to control a little bit of that information going out into the general public because there are security issues. I mean, you could take, you could use a cell phone to record security things at yeah. the prison and, and they don't even know it's being recorded and they don't even know it's being sent out to the, out of the prison because right. they don't, they don't have any way of monitoring any of that stuff. It's just, and I understand what you're saying. And then, I mean, ultimately, but technically kind of under the logic that you're putting forth, I mean, shouldn't an assault then kind of be seen in that context because it could lead to unrest and, and violence and danger. You know, it, you know, that's how, that's how usually unrest begins. Is it, it could, but OV-19 wouldn't be scored because a simple assault in the prison is a 93-day misdemeanor. 
I see. No idea. I see. I see. And the legislature decided just possession, simple possession of a cell phone right. is a five-year felony because they believe it's such a danger to the facility because they made it a five-year felony. Right. No, I do understand. Thank you very much, counsel. Thank you. Justice Clement. No questions. Counsel, you have a little under two minutes left. At this point, I'll thank you. Thank you. And this is the first time in front of you and I appreciate it and I will rest. And thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Curcio, I think you have a few minutes left for rebuttal. Yes, Your Honor. I, I, I'd like to start um, picking up on the, the a point with the uh, assault analogy. The, the prosecution has taken the position that assault would never be scored uh, under OV-19 because it's a misdemeanor rather than a felony. I'd like to point out that under this court, court's holding in People v. Smith, any conduct that occurs in the prison post uh, before sentencing for for any offense can potentially be scored whether it's an independent um, felony or not so uh, fights uh, within the prison charges whether charges assaults or not could be brought up at sentencing and could potentially warrant scoring under ov19 if they meet the um, if they meet the criteria for ov19 which is to threaten the security of a prison in, in our view, uh, what does that, what does that position matter to you, though? I understood that's what he said, and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're re repeating it for us. But why does that matter as it relates to your case? We think it matters because, because again, we, we don't believe OV19 was intended to apply to, to any misconduct that occurs within a prison. We think it's intended to occur, it's intended to apply only to the most serious um, conduct, the conduct most likely to result in in unrest or to in, in endanger prisoners. Uh, to endanger corrections officers, inmates, or result in other uh, uh, serious breaches of security. So it, it, to the extent the prosecution's theory is, is limitless and would apply to any, um, to any crime committed within a penal institution, we think that that shows that it's not consistent with the text of the, of the guideline. Uh, okay, I mean, but but the whole point that you were making is that he claimed that a simple assault wouldn't be twenty five points, but but only because he, he his point was that it can, would never be taken into account at sentencing at all. But it would be it could be taken into account at sentencing if it happened between the commission of the sentencing offense and the sentencing hearing. There you go. I'll let, I'll let you use the rest of your time as you see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, another point, I believe it was Justice Viviano um, proffered a definition of threatened, which is to be a source of danger. That, that is one of the common definitions. The, the definition that we believe most aptly fits within this statute is to be likely to injure or to endanger actively. Those come from the Oxford Online Dictionary and are specific to the, the sense of the word as it's used here. Uh, that, that being a, the figurative sense as threatening um, an impersonal agent or object here being the security of the prison. We run, uh, those uh, definitions make clear, again, that this is intended to be only for the most serious types of offenses and only for ones that are that like uh, the use of the word likely in those definitions, we think means more likely than not. And we don't believe that um, the use of the cell phone is more likely than not to, to undermine the security of a, of a prison if the, the prisoner who possesses it has no intent to use it for nefarious purposes. Um, with, am, I, am I right about the maximum sentence, the attempt? Was that a mistake? Your Honor, I, I'm honestly not certain. I was under the impression that the maximum sentence for this offense is five years. It is, but 750.92, the attempt statute, the second subsection says if the offense so attempted to be committed is punishable by imprisonment in the state prison for life or for five years or more, the person convicted of such attempt shall be guilty of a felony punishable by imprisonment in the state prison, not more than five years or in the county jail, not more than one year. So I mean, there's an option here, but I don't think that, that was contemplated making it a, a, a one year. A one year. So in any event, the, the maximum sentence would be five years, I think, in that scenario. Yes, I, I, be, I believe this is subject to a maximum of, of five years, and I, I think that's reflected in the um, in the joint appendix, Your Honor. Oh, so maybe I just saw it incorrectly. I thought the sentence, the original, the sentence was eleven months to thirty months. Yes, that that is his his sentence. But I, my memory from the transcript is that the judge was under the impression that he could receive a maximum up to five years. 
per perhaps that I'm misremembering. Okay, I mean, I just, I wonder, I wonder what, what, what it is we're after here. If you could get the same amount of months and then would end up with an increase from the maximum to 60 months, same amount of months on the minimum, and I'm wondering what, what it is this is all about. But, but I understand your, your position. Yes, he's just seeking resentencing with the, the lower guideline range, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, you may conclude, uh, you, Mr. Curcio, you are out of time if you, you want to. <laughs> there's no further questions, I will uh, rest my case, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Let me make sure. Any other, any additional questions? Okay. Thank you both for your presentations. The case, the case will be submitted. Um, and thank that you. concludes today's case call. See you in January. Thank you.